Okay, that's great. Okay, Sandy, Mike. Okay, I think we're we're a good time. Thanks for everybody logging on, and uh, thanks for Jerry for organizing today's session. I know he's more the ringleader. We we have other thanks to give out that he wouldn't tell me who it was, but it turns okay, out one okay. of them's right across the street from me. Um, and uh, they've all agreed to a recording, so this will be uh, posted on the website later uh, for people to re-review if you want to. Or I know there were a couple people that. Uh, had conflicts but really wanted to be here so they asked me if we'd record it uh, and so without further ado i turn it over to our mc of the day gerald ward with the sunrise from mount desert island behind him trivia point is that's the first place you can see the sunrise in the u.s and it's 5 30 right the there morning. on cadillac mountain above jackson laps right okay so those of you can shut your video off if you like it i hate to look at myself talking so I'm gonna shut my video off if I can figure out how to do it right here. Okay, and then you guys can do it too. So the first speaker will be Elijah Edmondson, who's at NCI Fort Detrick Frederick, and he'll give us a, a presentation of a kidney case. So you share the screen, you know how to do that, Elijah. And let's see. Okay, can you guys see in here? Yep, that's it. Yep, perfect. All right. um, so I'll start with just a little bit of an introduction to this case. Um, so uh, my name is Elijah Edmondson. I work at the Frederick National Lab, which is in Frederick, Maryland. Um, and so uh, I mainly do pathology support for preclinical research. And um, here at um, Frederick National Lab, there's four of us working uh, in this department, four veterinary pathologists. And so most of what I do is research pathology support, but then we also do a little bit of diagnostics with animal colony health monitoring. So just an introduction to this case, this is actually somewhat uh, timely because back in December of 2018, we were working up um, some colony health issues with the PDX clinic. Uh, they, they mainly use NSG and nude mice to, uh, to evaluate xenographs. And so what we had found with these is that there was pyelonephritis cases that were originating from just a single human tumor model. And this human tumor model was coming directly out of the um, NIH clinics from the patient to the mice. Um, and we found eventually after looking at several things that uh, uh, it was likely a chromobacter xyloxocytans, uh, um, which we think was coming from the patient as an opportunistic infection and then infecting the NSG mice and causing this polynephritis. So that's something that we were working through in December. Um, and then on Christmas Eve, and that's not, um, it's not an exaggeration. So it's Christmas Eve, Last case of the, get, of, the, of the day, I got a couple of uh, cases from the same, same group. Um, I wasn't sure what model, but uh, I thought, all right, this will be quick. It's probably pyelonephritis, um, and uh, I can get home for Christmas Eve. And this is what I got. So right away, um, I could tell that it's not pyelonephritis, although we do have some pyelonecrosis uh, from this um, magnification. But you can see that uh, there's a lot of loss of renal parenchyma and probably degeneration of tubules um, in the kidney. And there's this sort of oscillated uh, surface to the renal capsule indicating again loss of parenchyma. So these were older NSG mice. Um, um, I think they were around 300 days. Uh, and all of the mice that were getting sick were from the same model. So they all received the same xenograft um, implants. So as you look more closely, um, again, you can see the pilot necrosis you could feel, uh, but the tubules are pretty diffusely degenerate. Um, there's uh, tubular necrosis, some regeneration. Uh, mm -hmm. As you look more closely at these tubules, oftentimes you will find Trying to find a really good example of these. Are those viral inclusions yeah. passing by? Bingo. Yeah. All right. There we go. So here's here's some pretty good ones. So here we have these karyomegalic renal tubular cells with yes, I think viral inclusions. Um, they're enlarged. They have uh, you know uh, peripheralized chromatin, and this is a bit pixelated. I apologize. I don't have a 40x or 400x scan on these, but. You can see that there's sort of an eosinophilic, hazy, glassy 
inclusion body in these tubules. So this was uh, December 2018, and luckily I had read a cell paper that uh, Corey Brayton was involved with and a few other veterinary pathologists that described this entity, and I was, I was looking for it. I didn't want to find it on Christmas Eve, <laughs> but, uh, but that's what, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys know already, um, but mouse kidney parvovirus. This is an atypical parvovirus that infects um, immunocompromised mice mostly, and it, it creates this sort of uh, uh, a renal uh, disease. Well, also to, to be fair, uh, this is probably the first finding of it at NIH. I, I saw many kidneys over many years, but not, so, not no NSG mice, but a lot of immunodeficient mice <clears throat> never saw this. So, so that's a pretty interesting finding. Elijah, that's so cool. We don't see that radiating pattern. It's for us much more multifocal, though um, we'll catch it in um, nude sentinel mice and not in the more immunodeficient animals. Could really you beautiful. Identify yourself, please. Oh, sorry, Denise Mai from uh, Comparative Pathology Lab. Okay. Yeah, so Denise, hi, thank you. Um, they, they, in the paper, they described the lesion in new mice as well, and it's much more, uh, much less severe in new mice for whatever reason. Um, but then the NSG, severely immunocompromised mice, you start to get this. Again, it's, it takes a while, something like six months, I believe, to be infected to get a lesion this severe. Um, it's but, really but impressive. Right. So that's, that's the second part of what I wanted to talk about here. I wasn't sure, this isn't really a case presentation so much, um, but here, here's the, the initial case at Frederick National Lab. Um, we did do, uh, we developed an RNA scope assay. So it's an um, in situ hybridization assay where you can uh, detect the viral uh, nucleotides. And that's what we did here. So red is the chromogen, and you can see that the kidney just completely lit up. Uh, it was PCR positive. We did that and some EM on these cores. Um, another interesting thing about this, it's been, uh, veterinary pathologists have been seeing these inclusion bodies for something like 40 years, maybe more, and no one could really figure out what it was because, first of all, the, the electron microscopy results are inconclusive. It doesn't really have good viral particles. And they would do, you know, PCR and other diagnostics for all the other known um, infectious agents, and everything would always be negative. And so it wasn't until the... Um, the work that uh, was presented in that cell paper entitled an atypical uh, mouse kidney parvovirus, something like that, where they found the infectious agent that way. So um, again, mostly it infects renal tubules, but it will also, we detected it at least in some rare hepatocytes, you know, it had this kind of pattern. So I, this is a IBA1 chromogen um, IHC. So the brown is macrophages, Cooper cells in the liver. And then again, the red is the, the mouse kidney parvovirus nucleotide sequences. And so we did see it in the hepatocytes for whatever reason, just rarely. But so the more interesting part of this story, okay, so here's, uh, again, December 24th, and we found this uh, infectious agent, and we had to alert all the um, PDX clinic resources, and it was quite a um, spectacle at the time. Is that but more exciting than your Christmas presents? <laughs> yeah, that was the Christmas present for sure. We all had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> but then, uh, so what we started, we developed a PCR assay and we started testing to see where it's coming from. And that's when things got pretty interesting, really, because it's basically everywhere. Um, Immunocompetent you know, mice, whatever, it's something like 16% uh, of our uh, sentinels are positive for this. And so we went on we, to find uh, a, a certain colony, a certain group of uh, CD1 mice that were all positive for whatever reason. Um, they were they were used for embryo transfer, so they were a bit uh, older. But um, we were able to, to to look at this virus a little more closely because we had 35 of them or so, and we individually housed them all so that we could follow along and and see what kind of diagnostic methods worked the best. You know, a cage swab versus urine. PCR versus sequel PCR, that sort of thing. Um, and we found that, uh, you know, I expected they would probably clear the virus after they developed an immune res response to it as, as their uh, immunocompetent mice, but they maintained positivity and shedding for as long as we did this study, which was um, past 300 days after the initial posit you know, positive result. Hey, Elijah, this is Patty P. from UC Davis. Um, I just wanted to tell you the story continues to be really exciting, and your paper was 
absolutely phenomenal. I was really, I was really uh, um, um, pleased to see that and excited to see the results. We study parvoviruses that are the non-proto, you know, canine parvovirus is the anomaly in the parvovirus family because all the other ones are persistent exactly like what you say. And when we follow them in shedding in feces of any kind of any kind of small carnivore, whether it's whether it's you know any of the wildlife carnivores, they shed for years and years uh, on a literally a daily basis and never clear the infections. And that's amdo parvoviruses. That's that's uh, uh, especially is what we're we're studying, but also the chaparro or whatever they're calling them now, the chapa chapa parvo, worst yeah, name ever. Yeah, and maybe that exposes how little I know about vi you know, virology because, you know, I learned again canine parvovirus and other types of parvoviruses that are quickly cleared if you survive. And um, that's what I was expecting with this. But no, like you say, um, these guys just shed and shed and they're sort of subclinical shedders, uh, yeah. which is a big deal for the research world, especially if you have uh, immunocompromised mice. Well, and because it's a parvo, right, it's going to be in... You're, you're, you're thinking it's being in dividing cells, and so it's hard to know whether it's causing something or taking advantage of something. Have you looked at, it, are, are any of the mice models you're looking at models of tumors? Like, have you looked for the virus within tumors? Because we see it, we see it um, in proliferating cell populations, whether they're inflammatory populations or in tumor populations, at least the other part of those, the persistent. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. So I'll say what we have done. We've looked at NSG mice. That was one of the first things we were trying to figure out is how these NSG colonies got infected. And so what we did figure out pretty, you know, I don't want to go into all the details, is that we received some biological materials, some xenograph materials from, um, which were human, from an investigator, uh, from a group of investigators at another university. And that's how we believe that it came in. Then we tested, we tested the xenograph for whether it would be positive, it was negative in, the, in those mice, which, we, you know, we had tissue from that and completely negative. The only place we found it were in the kidney, in the liver, and, um, and that's really it in NSG mice. There are some publications where they found it in the intestine, but I wonder if that's maybe how it's coming into the body rather than an actual, uh, an actual active replication. Because in both CD1 mice and NSG mice, we looked at you know, everything we could think of, salivary gland, liver, gallbladder, you know, whatever we could, pancreas, all the GI sections, and we couldn't find it by an in situ hybridization there. Um, and, and again, we did look at tumor as well. This was human, human xenograft tumors. Uh, you know, we haven't looked at mouse models, you know, mouse tumor models within mice. But, I, I, uh, wonder, I wonder if you should, you know, since it's got a, a it might be species specific. I wonder if mouse models derived from mice might be different. Right. No, that's that's something we have not looked at. You know, like allograft models in mice, we have not looked at that. Um, so it might be something else to look at. Yeah, I mean, it's something else to look at that we haven't done. So my understanding of the of this mouse to parvovirus is that it doesn't it doesn't care about dividing cells, and that's one of the things that makes it peculiar compared to the proto parvoviruses. But you know, maybe there, and so I'm curious, Patty, if, um, you know, if some of your chaparvoviruses or non protoparvoviruses are um, like that, because, you know, we always, I always learn that parvoviruses pe peculiarly like dividing cells and, and, well, the, and a, these, if, I mean, it's a, Corey, you're right. It's, it's a, it's a conundrum actually, because it's not even just liking them. It's the fact that they're, they are obligate in yeah. a dividing population. And yet some of the diseases we see that are spontaneous diseases that this parvovirus, that these parvoviruses are associated with are myocarditis. And that should be a terminally differentiated non-dividing area. So it's it's a they're very, they're very clever and also they're they're very genetically variable and so very different than the protoparvoviruses that that are tightly regulated in their in their uh, genome. So um, lots of questions about them and no particular association in humans with, with a disease state. And so not, not a whole lot of work on them. The mink amdos and of course this mouse one are the most beautiful work. Cool, thanks. I'm so glad to see them getting the attention they deserve. So you wanted to show the wild type, I mean the immunocompetent? Um, yeah, I can show that. I guess I have a little more time. 
there's only three. So it's well, don't worry about it. I, we'd like to see the wild type that had rare inclusions or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. Here we go. So my um, let's see. So we looked at 30 mice. We found inclusions in. I had three different pathologists looking at this, and we found inclusions in uh, two mice. Um, but so most of the time, this is what it would look like. We would get so this again. This is CD1 mouse. We knew they were positive. This was maybe at the 200 day, 200 to 300 day after the initial positivity. And so um, what we did find is uh, some tubular degeneration and some lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, which isn't all that um, unusual for aged mice, really. Um, but in addition to that, let's see if I have my little marker. There we go. If you look really closely at these, you might find these um, inclusion bodies um, in immunocompetent mice. And so really the way that we found a lot of these is because we also did RNA scope. So I'll just show you what that looks like. Um, because the inclusion bodies, you know, tend to be positive for RNA scope. So again, mostly you're gonna see, uh, uh, you know, kind of a sparse staining pattern. But then, you know, as you go closer, you'll see individual tubules that are positive. Like this. But, so, Elijah, I want to point out that you say it's a sparse staining pattern, but this is a five micron section uh, and out of, you know, approximately a million nephrons in the kidney, you are looking at about 50 total nephrons. And so the load that you've demonstrated here, don't kid yourself, that's high. That's a high load in that, in that mouse, I think. And, and, but something that the way that we normally do diagnostics is easily missed because of exactly what you're saying. They're just haphazard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and sorry, I, you're totally right. Um, I'm comparing it to NSG mice where the load is just absolutely remarkably dense, you know, like this. Uh, but again, yeah, that's, it is fair. I don't know what, 10 tubules per five microns. That's not, you know, insignificant. And so this is also a pattern that we would commonly see. You would have a renal uh, um, papilla that has a lot of viral particles like this, no corresponding lesions really. And then you might see almost a negative cortex, except if you, you know, look closely, there's just a few little spots where you'll see, you know, some virus within the cytoplasm of some of these renal tubules. And uh, the H and E lesion here is, you know, you would essentially miss it um, at, for these individual tubules. And oftentimes when you start to get the, the dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates like I showed, those are typically negative for viral particles. So for whatever reason, when they are actively replicating, um, once they're recognized by the immune system, I guess, then uh, that shuts down the replication pretty effectively. I, I don't know. Um, so yeah, I was, I was sort of expecting to see viral uh, nucleotides maybe in these regions, but that's not the pattern that, that I saw. It'll be you know, these tubules that are basically you know, almost normal by H and E. And then you get this uh, shedding pattern with no lesion. So have a lot of seen the, um, if you're working with STZ, with streptozotocin, have you seen the, uh, in, the vacuolation inclusion type things that uh, you get with streptozotocin at certain stages? I'm not familiar with that. So I just sent you and Jerry some still pictures of some some of my cases, and you know I always I, I understand that you know that streptozotocin toxicity can cause these sorts of changes, but I also don't know if um, you know what I don't have access to is the information as to whether um, MKPV was contributing to some of these in some of our cases. So okay. Uh, anything else, Elijah? We have to move on eventually. Okay, well, that was great. So one thing I want to point out, Elijah likes to use QU path. Maybe sometime, Sandy, we should have a meeting partially on the different types of slide viewers. And, and uh, I know Elijah loves this program pretty much, and I use it occasionally. And uh, it's an open source uh, viewer where you can do a lot of image analysis and programming. Okay? That sounds so, good. I'd love to know people's solutions for databases, too.